Good morning. This is Anthony Nyagan and today we are going to talk about sexuality in Christianity. The mystery of sexual union in the Bible. Let's take a look at it. A man clings to his wife and they become one flesh. This was in Genesis. In the recorded history of Western civilization, God declares as a providence for the creation of man and a woman. A man clings to his wife and they become one flesh. Then 2000 years ago, Jesus repeats it. He says in Matthew 19.5, a man shall be joined to his wife and the two shall become one flesh. Then in Ephesians 5.31, St. Paul validates it, a man will be joined to his wife and the two will become one flesh. That is Ephesians 5.31. These words, two flesh becoming one flesh, are very emphatic about the transformative powers in a sexual union. Transformation so powerful that the two, in this context, two bodies or two flesh becoming one. It is so transformative that a sexual union altogether transforms us and alters our state of being. Now, it is a few thousand years since Genesis and 2,000 years since Jesus and St. Paul. Have we come across any couple whose two bodies transformed as one in the process of their sexual union. Nonetheless, it is a providence made by our Father in heaven, repeated by Jesus and further validated by St. Paul. Clearly, there's, it, there is a mystery associated with it. Jesus says, for in the resurrection they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are like angels in heaven. That is Matthew 22.30. Then he says in Matthew 22.32, he is not God of the dead, but of the living. Brothers and sisters, the kingdom of God is not something we are going to inherit after we die. Kingdom of God is eternal. So which means kingdom of God exists on earth just as well because it is eternal. So the kingdom living is not about what we are after we die. Kingdom living is for the living just as well. Therefore, the providence God made about the transformation by way of sexual union is not something that we would experience after we die. Not at all. Jesus contradicts with it in Matthew 22.30. It is to be realized while we are living. Why has this transformation not taken place and recorded in the history of Christianity ever since Christ. Something went wrong. What is it? Ask an eagle about the sky. Ask a humpback whale about the ocean. 
ask the mighty lion about the jungle. What can they tell us? There is nothing to tell except accept. See, figuring this out, it does not make sense. If we were to ask a group of sex deprived men and women about the mysteries of sexual union, what can they tell us? Except theories that they learned. See, they have to call councils and attempt to break abstract phenomena down to fragments, define the fragments and put theories based on their narrow definitions. See, for human intelligence, the phenomena can only be comprehended by the knowledge of duality. What is the knowledge of duality? See, that is, identify the equal and opposite counterpart of an observation. For instance, righteousness and sin. And if righteousness is hard to define, then go on to define the opposite counterpart, which is sin. If sin is understood, then righteousness is assumed to be intuitive. If we read the books on catechism of the church, magisterium, we find exhaustive categorical definitions about sin, but not even a fraction of it about righteousness. Same approach to Jesus and Satan, morality and immorality. Define immorality so morality can be understood. See love and sexuality also fell victims to the knowledge of duality. See, love is an incredibly abstract phenomena. Church has fragmented and defined love and taught us to love. In the process of it, church also established barriers to love. Fear. Fear God. Fear death. Fear hell, fear purgatory, fear the unknown. Fear limits us. Fear limits our inner freedom. Where fear exists, love cannot survive. Fear and love cannot coexist. Fear dispels love. Love dispels fear. We cannot fear our beloved and love them at the same time. Equally, we cannot fear life and live it at the same time. We cannot fear God and love Him at the same time. And the second thing is seeking knowledge. See, knowledge keeps the loving alive. Knowledge sustains love. Not only it sustains love, it keeps us growing in love. Church also limits us in the seeking of knowledge. It tells us, well, there are four Gospels and the Epistles and the Bible. That is all there is to know. The information in that is sufficient. And everything else is non-canonical. It is implied. Don't read them. But St. John the Apostle says in the last sentence of his Gospel, 
if everything has to be written down about Jesus, the world cannot contain the number of books that could be written. Jesus himself says, the Holy Spirit will come and teach you everything. So the knowledge is integral to loving. Limiting the knowledge is not. See, curb the inner freedom to express love. You cannot love. When inner freedom to express love is curbed in the guise of morality, Sexuality invariably falls victim to it. Church controls the sexual expressions of Christians. No question about that. But is that the end of it? See, when mystical theology was sidelined and moral theology introduced, ever since the takeover, an institutionalization of the church by Emperor Constantine. Institutional Christianity became a successful model in controlling the moralities and mindsets of people. From then on, governments and businesses and institutions adopted the same model of morality and the socialization of followers as means to define policies, law and order, social norms, community guidelines. All of these became easy because the people were Christians in the Roman Empire since Emperor Constantine. The method of mass socialization still continues and effective everywhere the Western civilization is widely established. Invariably, Christianity has control over every aspect of our lives in our day-to-day -day living. No question about it. So what's wrong about it? See, Christian theology is based on duality-based intelligence. As such, it does not take into account the abstract nature of religious or natural phenomena. Love and sexuality simply do not lend, them, lend themselves to duality-based theses. Duality-based theses evolve around modular-based cause and effect relativities. Essentially, the thesis itself is a structure based on material order. This is how knowledge is acquired since Plato. It started 500 years before Christ. So when Christ was around, the Judaism is a very intellectual religious order. But there is a problem with such knowledge. See, since quantum science, matter itself has a conscious counterpart. In other words, the matter does not have an equal and opposite matter alone, they both have conscious counterparts. And that counterpart is pure energy and intelligent on its own. Consideration of consciousness is totally absent in the 2,000-year-old duality-based theologies of the Church. The theology and the doctrines of the Church are still 
stuck in a Platonian philosophical era that was 500 years before Christ. See, it requires tremendous efforts to update itself in an institutional model that has been effective and rewarding for 2000 years. Why would anyone want changed? Well, that is the traditionalist position within the church. See, for 2000 years, human sexuality has been about body-centric notions in sexually repressive cultures and civilizations around the world. Ever since the evolution of economies, in the Western colonization of African and Asian nations, sexual repressions and governance based on equally repressive philosophies have taken over the entire world, in other words. Since Sigmund Freud, body-centric sexuality, in the total absence of the awareness of conscious energy, has also evolved as answers to human sufferings due to sexual repression. It's very sad. A man shall be joined to his wife and the two shall become one flesh, that Jesus said in Matthew 19.5. See, these words defy all body-centric notions and interpretations. Simply because two bodies cannot unite and become one unless the uniting bodies cease to exist. I'll give you an example. I'll give you two. See, for instance, when we take uh, the meat of a chicken and a lamb and we chop them and mix them as minced meat to make Middle Eastern kebabs. Let me ask you a question. Can we separate the meat after we do that? See, they have ceased to exist as chicken and lamb. I'll give you another example. If you take a black clay putty and a white clay putty, mix them together. See, we have a grey Clay putty. Can we separate black and white after that? No, we cannot. See, what happens in the process of it? See, a new body emerges out of the two bodies and the new body has all the properties of the emerging bodies but the emerging bodies cease to exist. This is classical physics. See, in these words, God was not talking about flesh being united. He was alluding to the counterpart of our flesh, which is the conscious energy because energies can coalesce, can converge, can deconverge, can recoalesce and remain as itself without having to perish. In other words, in our state of fully conscious awareness, the conscious energies of a man and a woman can go through the stages of foreplay, union and afterplay in a sexual union and continue to remain as two bodies without having to perish. Earlier I asked a question, 
why has the transformation of two bodies becoming one has not taken place in the recorded history of Christianity. Has it? The answer is yes. It was during the conception of Jesus Christ in the union of God and Mother Mary. In that union, bodies did not unite. The body of Mother Mary and the formlessness of God had no role to play in that union. Conscious energies of God and Mother Mary did. See, unfortunately, all the discussions in the theology of body totally fail to comprehend this mystery. For the church, the chastity of Mother Mary is irrelevant. The virginity of Mother Mary is irrelevant. How could a woman who gave vaginal birth to Jesus Christ could still remain a virgin? Say for the church, Mother Mary never had a sex is more relevant. Brothers and sisters, forget the idiosyncrasies of the church. For spiritual seekers, Mother Mary's motherhood to Jesus is more relevant than her virginity. Mother Mary, as the only human being who united with God and evolved as oneness in the union with God, is more relevant in spirituality. In Christian traditions, Mother Mary is the only human being who united with God and evolved as one with God. Therefore, she is worthy of worship. Stop this denial about we only venerate her. We must worship her. Let me give you another example. The Samaritan woman in the Gospel, chapter 4 is in John's Gospel, talks about the Samaritan woman Jesus met by the Jacob's well. In that, Jesus was talking about the water that I will give become in them a spring of water gushing up to eternal life. That is John 4, 14. See, it is not a static body of water Jesus was talking about. It was a water that has so much power, the power of which that could cause it to rise up to heaven. Imagine that power and energy. Then Jesus says, in order to give this powerful energy, Jesus asks the woman to go call your husband and bring him back. So for this powerful energy to be realized within us, it requires a man and a woman. For Jesus it is completely irrelevant how many husbands that woman had. Whether she was adulterous or not, was not relevant to this spiritual realization. Whether we are sinners or not is not relevant to this spiritual realization. The relevance is marriage, husband and wife, and the mystery of spiritual realization by way of sexual union between 
man and a woman. I often get asked the question about the LGBTQ community and the sexual union. See, sexual realization and spiritual realization through sexual union is a providence for a man and a woman united in love. In Sanskrit, this is known as a spiritual marg. Marg means a path to follow. That means it is a mark for people, this is a mark for people who made the choice of samskara, that is marriage between man and a woman for a family life. But there are thousands of other marks. And we can't choose any one of them according to our aspirations and the choices in our lives. In other words, sexual union is a meditative exercise in heterosexual relationship. LGBT community or LGBT is an alternative lifestyle for sexual union and there are other marks exist for them to pursue spiritual realizations. For LGBTQ and celibates, sexuality and sexual union has not disappeared. Their meditation evolves towards a union directly with the pure consciousness of God for the realization of divine consciousness. See, God's love is very passionate for crude and Freudian interpretations. It feels like a sexual relationship. See, when we read the songs of Solomon, Ecclesiastes, and the stanzas of Saint John of the Cross, we come across incredible sexual overtones in these readings. In Hinduism, the songs of Meera and many more. See, sexual inferences are very common in Hindu rituals for the same reason. See, how we handle the spiritual grace such as sexuality is incredibly relevant in spiritual seeking and divine realizations during our lifetime. See, we must approach these as meditative exercises with utmost love, respect and religious reverence. In earlier discussion, I asked, ask an eagle about the sky. What can the eagle tell us? Well, there is nothing to tell except accept the mightiness of the sky and evolve as a part of it. See, again, I don't want to go into the body theology of the church, but something must be said about it. Of course, the consideration of conscious energy as the counterpart of material body is totally ignored in the theology of body. But sexuality is described as a providence and a human responsibility to give. Remember, to give. Give love. Give semen. Give 100% with the beatitude of unitive and reproductive purposes without a chance at 
frivolous wastage, whereas frivolous wastage constitutes sin. <laughs> but the conflict is, God's creation does not thrive in giving, it thrives in receiving. See, earth does not pump nutrients into the tree. The tree sends its roots into the earth and receives what it requires. God does not pump blessings and graces to us. We seek them. A mother does not pump breast milk into the mouth of a child. She brings the child close to her breasts and the child receives the milk. A child is not conceived as the man pumps semen into the woman. A child is conceived as the result of how the womb opens up and receives the healthy sperm. Therefore, the entire act of sexual reunion in spirituality is not about what a man gives to a woman, but how woman receives the conscious energy of man and partakes in it. <laughs>